as president, his name was Elwood Ingo, a prince of a man. And he knew how to inspire people. Sitting at your desk, he would come in at noontime. And in those days, when the vice president of styling came in, that was serious business. And he'd walk up to you while you were working, on your clay, looking at it. And he would ask you the question, son, is your house paid for? And you'd say, no, sir. And he'd say, mine is. And he always had an ax. And at that moment, he'd take the ax and he'd put it into the back of your model and say, get hot, kid, and leave the room. Now, that was motivation. Otto, dear Otto. Cars have, all, have always been uh, highly uh, emotional uh, objects. You know that's the reason why there's an awful lot of car museums around the world, and there are very few refrigerator museums. But the greatest collection of cars is out here, on the streets. In terms of the number of cars produced and the small numbers of designers. They are the single most influential design group on earth. I mean, they shape our city streets. Over 30 million cars are sold in Europe each year. Among these, the family car is the most common. The family car is a busy car. It's always in use, visible everywhere. It's cheap to buy, cheap to run, but above all, it must look good. The family car is probably the most difficult car to design of all the various cars there are in the world. Basically because they have to meet an awful lot of requirements. They're driven by a whole variety of different people with different expectations. This is a car that has to meet the economic needs of a family, and it would be pretty apparent to anyone looking at it. People who, who buy a, a car, they, they buy it um, not necessarily purely because of uh, means of transport, we know that, but because they, it will correspond to an image which they have of themselves. And I think this is something which uh, is very special about motor cars. People don't choose a, a hairdryer because they believe that this is going to uh, contribute to their overall image. Whilst people will choose very carefully a car, they will choose very carefully the color of the car in order that this should be an extension of their personality. All cars have become so good these days. I mean, mechanically, they're extraordinarily good. Even the cheapest and simplest car now is so much better than the best car you could buy 10, 15 years ago. But it's taken for granted that the thing's going to work properly, that it's going to be safe, it's going to look after you in an accident. It'll stop well and steer well, drive pretty well. So what you're left with is improving the aesthetic, pushing the aesthetic ahead. That's the bit that's left the designer much more in control of the way the car's going to be. When, for any given class of car, quality, reliability, and price are all about equal, the only product differentiator nowadays is design. You don't buy a Vauxhall Corsa because it's fundamentally a better car than a Nissan Micra. You buy it because its styling, its design, the shape of it, the interior styling, appeal to you more. Europe's biggest contribution to car design was the invention of the small hatchback. The revolutionary effect this had on the shape of family cars should not be underestimated. The hatchback has tested the inventiveness of designers for over 20 years. Launched in 1974, the Volkswagen Golf marked the beginning. But this revolutionary German car was designed by an Italian. He's the most prolific designer in the world. With over 80 different cars to his credit, there are reckoned to be 25 million examples of his work on the road. He has produced sports cars and luxury cars, but he's best known for his small family cars. 
which include the Fiat Uno, the Panda, and most recently, the Fiat Punto. As far as I'm concerned, it is much more stimulating. It is more interesting to design small cars, particularly because we can see more of them on the road. This makes them more important. The small car is more difficult to design, and therefore more stimulating in terms of research. Small cars are my favorite. Gijaru is one of the greatest car designers ever. He's also an interesting businessman because at the same time he was producing deeply rational cars like the Volkswagen Golf, like the Scirocco Coupe, he was also making trips to Korea to sell car designs to the fledgling industry over there. He does have a tremendously good sense of proportion and he has a very, very good sense of where to put a line on the surface. In designing a car, it is crucial to take care with the proportions because they are vital to the aesthetic success of the car, just as when drawing a man or a woman's face. The size, shape and distance between the nose, the eyes and the mouth is fundamental. Beauty or ugliness depends on the way nature gives form and position to these features and how they come together to give the overall look. This car gives you a particular emotion because it is different from any other car of its type. It is a very compact car. It has something that turns you ahead when you see it in movement. It is more like a one-box than a two-box design. Its bonnet is more sloping than usual and the same can be said of the windscreen which becomes this delicate line which flows towards the rear part of the car. A characteristic part of the Punto is this soft section, this flowing curve, and especially this round bit which attracts the light and gives an impression of strength. An important part of the design was to give character to the real section here. We found difficulty with this section, especially where it joins with the back window. The rear light looked quite boring, so we gave it some features by adding this unusual rear light, which at the first sight might look strange, but it gives the car character, a personality. If the hatchback has led designers to produce small cars with more character, then aerodynamic research has brought another big change. European cars were the first to go streamlined, rejecting boxy American styling. The Americans had a great influence in European studios, such as the Chrysler studio in Coventry, the Vauxhall studio in Luton, and the Ford studio in Essex. And they were bringing in American ideas very much into the European um, uh, arena. I think it was then that the Sierra broke free, or the designs of the time broke free th through the Sierra. It was uh, non-American. Now, the Americans today uh, have more or less followed it. I think Ford's learned a lot from the Sierra in Europe and put it into their cars in the States. But the Sierra was destined to be controversial because the car it replaced was the ever-popular, hard-edged and boxy Cortina. Uh, its public um, reception was mixed. It took some time for it to be accepted, but from then on, the public expected greater change, and I think that was very good for us as designers. The Sierra was designed during the 1970s in Ford's Cologne studio by a team of Maverick designers under the direction of Uwe Banzer. Not just the cooling there, I think we need to have a certain amount of gap so that on impact... Well, if I look around today, about 12 years after the Sierra was launched and 16 years after it was designed, I think it was one of the cars in the last quarter of the century which has influenced a lot of other cars that are still on the road today by breaking away from a classic, very architectural, very hard-edged concept of design, by creating a more sculptured approach, obviously at that time influenced also by aerodynamic research. And uh, I think it is in some way a trendsetter, has been a trendsetter 
The experience of the radical Sierra on the young designers at Ford filtered into the rest of the industry as their careers progressed. Car design is a fantastically incestuous world. I mean, there aren't very many car designers. There are probably only six or seven hundred in the world. They all know each other, and their relationships tend to date back to their training. And they're fairly promiscuous in terms of moving around among manufacturers. In those days, we had um, people like Patrick Lecamor, who's now in charge of Renault Design. Uh, Peter Stevens had left. Peter Stevens, a designer I greatly admire for his work on McLaren and Lotus. Uh, Ian Callum, a good friend who's now very famous for having designed the DB7, beautiful car, and um, many others who are now in positions of responsibility throughout the, uh, the world. Harm Guy, who runs Porsche Design, a very prestigious job. And I think myself, who is uh, now responsible for one of the more famous marks in the world, every one of us went through the Ford training, and I think it was very, very good. Yes, the latest wind tunnel test... Uh... Part of that training meant selling their often artistic concepts to a tough, cost-conscious management. A production car is a work of art in that a designer has an initial concept that he's trying to sell. The same as a Flemish painter would have had an initial concept that he wanted to sell to a client. Now at that moment of concept, the designer in the studio, the automotive designer, then meets the client, the engineer, the product planner the aerodynamicist, who have a different way of looking at the vehicle. He has to assimilate that information into a package, a product that's still exciting, the same way a Flemish painter would have had to talk to the patron who wanted to have his wife in a green dress, 14 kids all ugly but he wants them to look nice, at the dog, show all my wealth. The painter had to accommodate and still keep the creative spirit that he was trying to achieve, that spark of creativity in his drawing, the designer does the same thing. Protect the initial concept, bring it to maturity, and put it in the marketplace. Bringing a concept to the marketplace has been made far easier by the arrival of the computer. The motor industry has taken to computers in a big way. Sophisticated computer graphics have narrowed the gap between the present and the future. Designers can now build virtual reality concept cars in amazing detail. Future designs can be added to existing traffic scenes. City cars can be scaled down to fit into narrow European streets. Anything is possible. But the real significance of computers is in the way they have locked together art and engineering. Today, designers and engineers share information on computer. The whole process of making a car is no longer sequential. You don't design it, engineer it, get the production guys in. Everybody works side by side. So when the designer is designing the car alongside the production people so that if he, pro he produces a design which is difficult to produce, the production people can say at the time, while it still exists on the computer screen, no, if we do it this way, it will work. This process is called simultaneous engineering. It means that the presses and molds that make the body panels of a car and even the robot's welding points are all derived directly from the designer's input. It's important to know how the thing is going to be put together, how the panels are going to be made, how you expect them to be fitted onto the car. That way you're not inhibited by the technology because you understand enough about to work with it and also maybe you can be sufficiently creative to push the technology a little further than it is at the moment. Yeah, one of the most challenging areas when you're designing a car is the A-pillar. That's the front pillar to the edge of the windscreen. Where that joins the bodywork is a very difficult transition to make. The pillar's quite thin.
thin in itself. There are some versions of Mercedes where the resolution is really badly done and you get the impression that an elephant sat on the corner of the windscreen and the thing's collapsed and ironically doesn't look strong at all. The, the dynamics of this pillar is very, very important to the overall proportion of any car. And the designer always wants the pillar to sit at exactly the right place at this point and at this point. Now the other problem, of course, is you've got a, a, a wing or a bonnet or a door which will come together at that point. And structurally, it creates quite a rat's nest. The character of this car can be seen here in the way the join between the door and the front wing has been resolved, especially this round bit here, which makes the car look as if it has more muscle. It is a very difficult area to put together and also very important from an aesthetic point of view. Gijaro is often admired for his solutions to difficult production problems. This kind of door where the door smooths into the top of the roof here was pioneered by Gijaru on the Uno. He calls them limousine doors, they're sometimes known as Gijaru doors. What it allows a designer to do is to eliminate the old-fashioned rain gutter which used to stick along the side of the car because rainwater actually goes into the groove and then is channeled out down there. So it makes the car look smoother. It enables you to put a softer angle in here and in fact, instead of being the roof of the car is no longer welded to this part of the car through the gutter. The gutter used to act as a flange to hold the two parts together. It's actually welded here, and this black strip actually covers up where the side panel of the car is fixed to the roof. Well-fitting body panels give a car a more expensive feel. The first person to turn this into an actual design philosophy was Uwe Barnson. Well, we perceive things we deal with by our senses. It's a, we have a great reservoir of subconscious experiences and associations. And I believe it is very important that a car communicates positive to these subconscious uh, perceptions. And this has a little bit to do with uh, a concept which I called design quality or perceived design quality. With other words, Ford at that time had an extremely sophisticated system to measure our quality in statistical terms. But we didn't really have a good handle on how is the product perceived by the owner who are not technical specialists and so forth and so forth. And uh, we based upon the five senses. One of the important ones, obviously, is seeing. The car has to look all right. Sound, very important. How does a car sound? How does a car door sound? How does a starter motor sound? Obviously, smell is a very important part. And I think even some re uh, uh, recently, some manufacturers have experienced that a certain glue that was used to glue the carpet to the floor under certain uh, climatic conditions developed a smell like dead fish. Now, that's, of course, something extreme, but the smell of, of, uh, of a car interior, for instance, is a subconsciously registered element of, of quality. Designers spend hours studying the tactile messages sent by the curves of a car body. On the back of the car, there's an interesting contrast in the way that radiuses are treated. There's one on the edge of the little spoiler here where the radius starts very softly, slowly tightens up as it goes over the edge and then softens out the other side. It gives you a very substantial feeling to the corner of the panel. It feels like the quality of the panel there. Inevitably, when you get down here, the only edge that you've got is one where the metal is folded over on itself and you're very aware of the thickness or thinness, in fact, of the material. It's very much more difficult to make that kind of edge feel as if it has expensive qualities to it than the much more controlled edge that you'll get up here. It's often only when you come to polishing the car that you discover these kind of things, and it's an interesting way of learning about the shape of the car. There's a kind of tactile research, if you like, in the way that you might be polishing over the surfaces. There's probably also some degree of pleasure in doing so, 
it could be likened, I suppose, to putting suntan oil on the back of a girl that you like. <laughs> yeah, what's so successful about this car, and it's a direction probably in which small cars are going now, is that it is, it's a very friendly kind of shape. It isn't one that's frightening or inhibiting, unnervy. It is a kind of cuddly thing. It's got elements about it that you can imagine the car becoming your kind of friend. Aggressivity was going out of fashion. After the, these nasty uh, decade of the 80s, this car just arrived at the right time to really um, change the, the, the overall approach of the automobile towards something a little more tender, a little more humane, it's a really a, a, a pet, you know, it's a, it's a nice little friend. The Renault Twingo is an aerodynamic hatchback with a toy-like character. It marks a trend towards lovable family cars at a time of increasing environmental opposition. A good designer or designers uh, who, who are worth their sort are people who are able to follow quite closely the the uh, social cultural development and uh, as such I've always said that designers are should be cultural sponges they should in fact really understand the way that uh, things are, are leading new trends absorbed by designers always appear first in show cars produced by the design studios We here at Citroën do not produce show cars, we produce concept cars. Concept car means a runner, prototype, a real vehicle, something you can taste. We build it for a very important reason in styling. It allows the design office styling to project to our management an opportunity that we see in the future. It's that big step something that's not two years away, something that could be five years away. We try to put it as far as possible in the future. If you were at the Tokyo Auto Show, I think it's five years ago now, there was a car called the Cocoon. All of these cars in that category have an inward-looking philosophy. Inward-looking. I put my family in the car. I drive through life protected. That's the philosophy that's been for the past five years. The philosophy of this car is entirely different. It's an open car. We live in an international community. Trade barriers are going down. We're not traveling through life hiding in our cars. The interior of this car, the philosophy is conviviality. I am not afraid of life. The exterior of the car if you look at the design very carefully, it is just one simple graphic. And that graphic is the shape of your eye. When you look at the car, the window graphic, it's an eye. The baguette on the side, the protection area, the shape of an eye. What we're saying is, is that the exterior of the car protects you. It has eyes looking out for danger down the road. Something jumps out, bang, the lights are on. It protects you. It's very easy to complain about cars, to complain about pollution, to complain about clogged up city streets. It's much harder to actually sit back and say, well, I like cars. I like looking at them. I like the sculptural form. I like the design of them. I find them attractive things to have around. It's a deeply unfashionable thing to say. Next week, Autoerotic enters the seductive world of luxury cars. Mm -hmm.